goodness of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit be with you and among us. We worship in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy is the Lord, the Almighty. He was, He is, and He is to come. He is worthy of glory and honor and power. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain. Worthy to take the scroll and break the seals. By his blood he purchased for God. The people of every race and tongue, of every folk and nation. Christ made of them a kingdom. And priests to serve our God. And they shall reign on earth forever. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Yes, come, thou fall. So you know what? This past week, Pastor Chip came in and said, officially, Pastor John, I've been here three years. On July 10th, three years ago, we installed this good-looking guy. Three years. So I thought, well, I'll have him come up, and maybe I'll just sort of have some fun and say, you're finally off probation. Thank you. No. <laughs> but I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. He's way, there's never been probation. What I really want to do is thank God that for three years we've been privileged to have a guy like this. A guy like this. Now, if you know Pastor Chip at all, tell me one thing that you like about him. Yes. He's nice. He's nice. That's a good thing. Anything else? He's funny. He's nice and funny. No, I like that. I like that. What else? He teaches us about God. Yeah. And, oh, wait. He wants to tell me something. Oh, he says he's very good looking. 
Very good book. Yes, he is. That part up. <laughs> but yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Well, that's right. Perfect dad, speak a lot. You know what I say most of all? He's a believer. He's a believer. What's it mean to be a believer? Think about that. What's it mean? You're on quite a little roll. What? To believe in God, to believe in Jesus. You know what? He takes this stuff seriously. Churches that have two pastors, we may make it look easy. It's never easy. Because we each have egos. We each have uh, things that we like to do on our own. We're not exactly alike. I'm much better looking than him. Okay, But he is younger than me. But as long as we agree that we're both believers. Because you know what that means? God comes first. God comes first. It's the key to any good marriage. God comes first. It's the key to any good family. God comes first. It never means we're selfish enough to say, it's got to be my way. It's never selfish enough to say, I've been here forever, Pastor Chip. This is how we do it. No. It's always just saying, what does God want us to do? You know what else I like about him? And I wasn't going to say this because my wife's sitting right over there. He likes to eat out. So occasionally... I can't look her in the eye. I can't see her. Just very occasionally, Carol. Very occasionally. We're on Facebook too. My wife's watching. <laughs> okay. Very occasionally. We'll end up at a restaurant. We actually like each other. And it's a bonus to have two of us serving the church because it's a big church. But mostly what I want to underscore is he's a believer. I'm a believer. And that's what we want mostly for you. Not just to fill 10 minutes of a children's sermon or to send you off to children's church for a few minutes. We want you to believe. So moms and dads that bring you, grandma and grandpas that bring you, they are believers. Are you believing the same way as me, 67 years old? No, I, I probably know fancier words. But Jesus is in my heart just like Jesus is in your heart. So you use your words. Pastor Chip will use his words. I'll use my words. And every person in this room will use their words because it matters that we are believers. So I don't usually do the prayer because Pastor Chip does that, but I'm going to do it today the day he does. So say it after me. Dear God. Dear God. Oh, I blew it. Hello, God. Hello, God. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for sending Pastor Chip. Thank you for sending me. Bless him. Watch over him. Protect him. And bless his family. Dear God, we love you. Be with us today and every day and help us to believe. Amen.
Gospels recorded in the 10th chapter of Luke, the absolutely very familiar story of the Good Samaritan. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Christ. You may be seated. Grace and mercy and peace be unto each and every one of you from Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Her name was Millie. She was the church secretary. And the church that she worked for was a lot like our church, sitting right on a busy street. So at least two or three times a week, someone would come in looking for help. Maybe gas money, maybe a little money for food, maybe even potentially a place to stay looking for help. She heard lots of stories. Some of them pretty believable and many of them far-fetched. But you see, it didn't really matter what the story was because her church that she worked for and all the churches in that local area had agreed to a certain policy. And the policy was to have them come in, share their story, and then because the city had lots of different resources, send them to the appropriate place. Only do referrals. There were all kinds of agencies that care. So all the churches agreed that's what they would do. And for the most part, that's exactly how it went. When someone would come in, Millie did things right. Right, according to procedure and policy, she would listen and then refer them and send them on their way. But sometimes, she wanted to do more. She had become over the years awfully good at listening to stories and judging whether the story was legitimate or real. And this day was one of those times that she wanted to do more. She wanted to get involved. She wondered if there was some way she could help because the man sitting across from her wasn't saying the usual things. He had not asked for money. He wasn't just passing through. He didn't have a sick wife with kids out in the car. There was no dying relative in the next city that he was trying to get to. He wasn't between checks that must be stuck in the mail. He was simply alone. His wife had left him. There had been a fire, everything else. And what Millie sensed that the man was sitting there is he was simply waiting to see if anyone cared. If anyone cared. So when she opened the drawer pull out the different policies and make the referral. She said, not this time. So she pushed the drawers shut, 
spent the morning not calling the agencies, but calling different people that she knows, trying to make some kind of connection, perhaps for a job, perhaps for temporary housing, just looking for some way to really help this man. And finally, it clicked. There was a match. Potential beginning job, a potential place to stay at least for a while. Finally, it fit. And when she put the phone down, she was filled with joy in her heart and her eyes sparkled. And she looked across the desk and the guy had really perked up. There was hopefulness in his eyes. And he, she said to him, okay, I'm taking you to lunch to celebrate. So when she left the office, she did that correctly. She locked up everything. And as she walked to the car, she found herself thinking, at least I did the right thing in that way. Because in honesty, she had not done things right. But she absolutely felt in her heart she had done the right thing. A certain man was making his way from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's a modern day story. He was mucked. He was mugged, robbed, stripped, beaten, left for dead. And the first guy that comes by in the story is the priest going down the road. And when he sees the man, he passes by on the other side. The next person is a Levite, one who also assisted in the practices, kind of like a lay associate in the congregation. And when he sees the man, he passes by. Now, to be fair to them, if they were on their way to do those kind of duties, they had already purified themselves. And to come into any contact with injury, with blood, with death, would have made them unclean. And for seven days, they wouldn't have been able to do anything. So if we're really honest about the priest and the Levite, they did things right. They passed by. They were doing things right. The next one's a Samaritan. We preached just about every other week, and the last time I preached was also about Samaritans being kind of the good guys. The Samaritan is obviously the good guy here, but he was not the good guys in the eyes of the Jews. They were the outcasts. They would have nothing to do with each other. One commentary said it this way. They had nothing to do with each other. They would go out of their way to not walk on the same ground that a Samaritan or a Jew had done. But it's a Samaritan who's the hero. Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where the man was, and seeing him, he had compassion on him. He went to him, and I honestly remember this as a little boy, one of my very favorite Bible stories. And you can picture the guy lifting him up, putting him on a burrow or a donkey or whatever, and taking him to an inn, and taking care of him, and making arrangements. And when he leaves, he pays the bill, and then says, if you have to do more, I'll stop back by and take care of him as well. He didn't do things right. Because if you're honest, a Samaritan wouldn't have done that. But he did the right thing. He did the right thing. There are times in our life, Jesus seems to be saying, where don't worry about doing things right. Just do the right thing. Now please hear this clearly. This isn't a sermon about procedures or processes or good order. We need those kind of things. Things have to be put in place to keep things running. But it is a sermon that says there are circumstances in life. There are times in life. And sometimes the Holy Spirit moves in our life. And we just absolutely know. Forget doing things right. We need to do the right thing. So we put aside a procedure. We'll put aside a tradition. We'll put aside the fact that, well, we've always done it this way. We'll put that aside and be God's people. Be God's people, the kingdom of God. The whole business started with this. How do you inherit eternal life? That's what set the stage for the entire story. How do you inherit eternal life? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, yeah, that's right. That's what it is. That's how you inherit eternal life. And then it's interesting. The scripture says it this way. In order to justify himself. He says, who's my neighbor? And here comes the story. Who's ever in need? Whoever you can help. Whatever you're able to do when you do not think so much right as you do the right thing. You do the right thing. Now to be the church, we have lots of policies and procedures. We want to do things right. 
We take care of our building. We look after it. Customs and people of God who work very hard to keep not just the building, but the whole congregation moving and offering and serving and being involved and reading and scripture and all of that. To be the church, to be the holy people of God, it does take some of that. But today Jesus puts a story right in front of us that says the gospel also calls us sometimes to say, don't worry about that. Do the right thing. The good Samaritan. Now when you think about it, the original good Samaritan isn't this guy. The original good Samaritan is Jesus. Jesus oftentimes healed people and others would sit around the outside and say, you shouldn't do that, it's the Sabbath. Jesus oftentimes would sit with sinners and people would sit around and say, you shouldn't do that, they're sinners. Jesus was the original good Samaritan who really didn't get caught up in doing the right thing but was always about doing things right. The righteous thing, the Christian thing, the people of God things. Millie on that particular day was a servant of Christ. All the other days she was a servant of Christ. But this was truly a servant of Christ where she was moved in her heart to say, today it just has to be this way. The good Samaritan probably would have been made up fun of by both sides. But most likely he saved the guy's life and took care of him for all of we're called to do that. We're called to do that. And as I say that out loud, let me be crystal clear. God does not want you to be put in danger. God doesn't want you to pick up every hitchhiker you see. God doesn't want you to invite people into your house that you don't know. But there are countless times in a week where sometimes you'll even feel it. And I'm sort of called to do this. Carol and I were in Columbus, Ohio the other day at the Jiffy Loop of all places. And we encountered a moment like that. It wasn't profound. It was just a family that needed help. Not much help. So when I paid my bill, I just whispered, pay their bill. No big deal. But to do the right thing is what that felt like. To do the right thing. To just be God's servant. Don't put yourself in danger. It doesn't always cost you money. It doesn't always cost you time. It just costs you your heart and your prayers and your life. What it really costs you is to be open. To be open to how God might use you. I'm really convinced that if you're a believer, there are times during the week that you know God is nudging you. And sometimes, a good Samaritan story says, follow the nudge. How do we even inherit eternal life? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love the Lord God, but also love your neighbor. Doesn't mean doing dangerous things. It means being God's person and being open to how you might help. I almost start every sermon. In fact, I probably do start every sermon. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father. I'm going to end it today with this. Grace and mercy and peace be unto those who need us. Grace and mercy and peace be unto those who need us through us. Because God empowers us with grace and mercy and peace. Go and be God's people. We always do it perfectly. I sure don't. I sure don't. I sure don't. Sometimes I am selfish. I know that. But I also know that God calls us to be open to where God might lead us. We serve a loving God who loves us first and invites us to love and serve us.